Ladies and gentlemen, we are recording. Welcome in Amsterdam back again. Um, Mike asked me to, to think of something for you to draw, to make a drawing again. Uh, you already made a drawing of your room, but we're going to make another drawing. And I will um, first talk a little bit more in depth about my work, also how I got started, where it's coming from. And next to this, I will also, um, at the end, I will explain what the next thing is that I want you to do. Again, my colleague Racher is here. Can you see him? Mm -hmm. Hey, there's Racher. Hello. And it's still beautiful weather in Amsterdam, Holland. <laughs> so we're ready to go. Okay, let me try. Yeah, it's okay. It's How you had a tight belly? Right. I just asked him in Dutch if he keeps on the time limit because I'm not sure how long we have. Um, but let's go, let's start. I will talk you through my work again a little bit. And again, I start with my self portrait The Naked Man on the Street. Um, do you see my screen? I'm just curious because I see something really different. I do, yes. Yeah, so okay. I can see your screen. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit because it's it's quite easy for people to say, yeah, I'm an artist, but but how do you become an artist or how did it happen or how, yeah, how do you develop yourself? So I want to go back a little bit because uh, today I'm 52 years old, so I'm almost a very old man. But once I was a very young man, like most people, and I I was living in New York and I made a book which was called On a Clear Day You Can See Forever. Because although I was trained as an, as an artist to paint paintings in a studio, I realized that I was a much better artist when I was walking the streets and experiencing things that, that came along. So I think this, this is for me a very yeah, important thing that I want to share because that's, that's really how I got started being making drawings of streets. So at first I wasn't really sure, like I knew I wanted, I wanted my art to be about walking through cities, but I wasn't really sure what the shape or the, or the form should be. So at first I was making a lot of photographs and I wrote a lot of text. like one of the texts is this, along long linear streets I was moved. And I was living at the time in New York, this is around 1995 more or less. Um, and yeah, although I didn't know what kind of arts I was going to make, I, I understood what kind of artist I wanted to be. And I didn't want to be an artist that was living in a studio, but I wanted to be an artist that was out there uh, uh, together with other people. And maybe it's interesting to say that when you're, when you're in your studio, you're in control of your own story. That's my wife. <laughs> Sorry, I fixed it not in a meeting. I'm going to go back. Hoi. No, I'm going to live, so I can't call Oh, yeah. That was my wife, and she was not very happy <laughs> because it's 5.30 almost, and I have to get home to cook for the children. Oh, no. That we're going to be fine. She will almost fail. <laughs> but what I was saying, and this is a good example of uh, somebody else is invading your story. So this was also the same for me, that right now I was invading, somebody else was invading my story. But to talk a little bit more about... Uh, about uh, the sketches that I did is that I felt it was really, I was failing, I was having my new life, like life was coming towards me. And I wrote little little texts and little poetries. So all these little different things that I was doing. Go back, next slide. And what I, this is one of the first maps I did. I mean, you can see this is Manhattan yeah, on the top here with Central Park. And what I did here was that I collected all the texts that I had and had them flow back into the city. So every street that I that I passed, I made a drawing of. And this this concept of tracing, I, I thought was very interesting because when you make a walk, you trace the earth, but you also trace experiences. So uh, as a as a translation of this idea, I had my portrait uh, drawn by different people, so with different handwritings. And for me, it was interesting because I also felt I was not only one person, but I was a lot of people and a lot of different people. 
And by asking people to trace my face, I did something similar that I was doing with the city. So the drawings that came out were all very different because the beautiful thing of tracing is that you can't really see what you're doing. So it's sort of like an invisible data almost, like it's, it's very difficult to mimic somebody's handwriting. And by this different, oh, this is the map, but I think I have another map. Yeah, by, you see by the different approaches, there also became very different images, although it was the same image. So for me, the handwriting is very, uh, very interesting because it contains identity. It contains, you could say data, but in a very abstract, subtle way. I will go back to the big maps that I made. So here, this was the invite for the book that I did and it's called On a Clear Day You Can See Forever. And it's very clear that here we see Manhattan with the streets next to it. And for me, this was a really beautiful translation of what I was doing because I felt I left behind things while I was walking. So therefore, this is also the map. And the texts existed mainly from texts that I was, that I wrote, that I was thinking about when I was walking. So it's a very direct translation maybe of what happens when you wander the streets. Oh, this shouldn't be there, but I'm gonna go on anyway. Oh no, this is the. Uh, <laughs> let me let me go back. I'm not really sure what happened. I'm gonna look at the. Uh, ah, now I see what happened. It's totally wrong, but that's all right. So after this, this lines of personality also made maps of my hands. So I asked, I went to like palm readers and I asked, can you tell me what is written in my hand? And although this is, this is totally subjective de data, it's very interesting what people come up with. So it's, it's another way of translating your, yeah, your information. Uh, I made a book which was called The Soft Atlas of Amsterdam. And I explained that the last meeting also, that was very much a book about a city, not with the data that you can really touch, but very much about the subtle data, the, the data that you, uh, the soft data that you can imagine. And what is interesting is that, that it's sort of like, it became like reportage drawings. This is the red light district, where you have many different layers of information. And what I used was, not only what I was seeing while I was walking the streets, but I also used uh, forums on the internet where people uh, describe the prostitutes that they visited. So it's, it's a very interesting way of, of getting all these different layers of data in one drawing. So at once you have here a uh, very direct here, a girl, a giggling drunken girl uh, crouches in the street to pee. And on the other hand, you has you have a have what people write down about the people that work here. For example, here Pamela from Gouda, she's is twenty five years of age. Fucking was obligatory. Writes she, she writes on hookers.nl, which is the website that I that I gained information from. So what I find interesting is that that that. In a map, it's very easy to use this, these different levels of information at the same time. And I also feel that when you use different levels of information, it's also more, in a strange way, more accurate or more, you understand it better. This is another drawing of a, a place where people who come into Holland are imprisoned because they don't have the proper papers. So this is a, a jail. Oh, oh, this is not going well. I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to go back to the contact sheets. But before I go back to the drawing tips, I want to show you some um, and tell you something about a project I did 
in northern Iraq about a refugee camp. And the refugee camp was fairly new when it got there. It was like about two years old. And um, we thought it was interesting to describe a refugee camp, not so much as a, a place for poor people, but try to describe it as a place of a new city. So really we've tried to look at it with a different perspective. And this website is still on. You can look, look it up on the internet. Uh, it's called Refugee Republic and you will find it. And I will go through it, like uh, tell you a little bit about what's on it. So this is how you get in. The website works with moving images and film together. It's, it's like a combination. And this is the actual camp of how it looks from space. These are like the the raw data. And there's, there's quite some interesting things to see. Like you see, for example, here, this is the, the transit, which is like the informal camp. And this is the formal camp. Here, the green place, this is where people are uh, evicted, evicted because they cannot be there. And this is my sketch. This is how I work. Like when I'm on the ground, I, I, I use a little map and I just put little notes that I can connect again back to my uh, sketchbook. And then I have the data together on the map. So location here is very important. And this is the map of the, of the camp that we also used. And here I put in, like you can see the hospital. And I thought it was very interesting to, to try to discover what's the dynamic of this place. You know, what's, how, how does it work? Like for example, there's a big gate where people come in. And this is where people get tickets. This is the irregular area where people can stay, but not really official yet. This is the singles area. This is where not people without relationships live, but this is for people who don't have a family in the camp. So we discovered there was like a big bakery, for example, here. That, that was really good that people came also from other places, came here, here this the, the flat round breads. Uh, there are a lot of like community spaces. There was an entertainment area. And this is, for example, how, how the huts were built. And it, it's, it's a very, also a very sad place. And I, I figured like, for example, I found this watchtower that was empty. Uh, and people pooed in it because up there, because that was like one of the few places where people have privacy. So privacy is a really big thing. And I also felt the safety was also weird because on, the, on, on one hand you felt there was like a big gate, but was the gate to protect the people from the inside from those outside or was it the other way around? Also the tents, that's also really weird. Like, you know, refugees go to tents but you also, the tents are built to, to sustain six months. But then most people stay in a refugee camp for more than 12 years. So that's a really, so tents are really an old fashioned idea of, of shelters, you could say. But there's also a lot of beautiful things like a little boy playing the guitar. And people who collect birds. Uh, here was like a, a hut that was built like a log cabin. Well, wounded birds, girls playing football in flip flops. And there was like a big wedding business in the camp because people have a lot of time, but also they, they marry each other because it's economically interesting. So there are girls from 14 and 15 years old that are married and for economic reasons. And uh, people could hire the wedding dresses and then they have a party in the in the tent below. Okay, this is just a, it, for me, it's an interesting to, to show camp, to show all the, all the different things of life within the space as one. Okay. This is one of the tents, the inside. It's like the room, like I showed you, but then this is a tent where people live. And I also, again, try to, try to tell the story by the details. 
Uh, for example, I thought here there was like an extra mattress because there are, there are a lot of time people come by, like visitors. And I also asked them if they are friends and they said, uh, yes, of course we are friends, but we don't have a choice. Oh, he says, I love to be alone, but here we live like Soviets. We see and hear everything. There are no secrets. This is a tent uh, of, of a local artist who made paintings of deceased people and portraits, but he also did paintings of, yeah, what I call like refugee uh, romanticism, like a, a, a girl, flowers, the bombs. And these are all political pro projects. Okay, I also discovered that there's some sort of like um, a living career in a camp, eh? a residential career. How, how, how do you, because once everybody has a tent, they want it to become a house as soon as possible. So it starts with a tent, a basic tent. And everybody who comes into the tent receives the tent. And there are about 17,000 households in this camp. Most of, the, most of the tents were manufactured in Pakistan. And the dura durability of a tent is about six months before it sort of like breaks down. So what people do is they improve it. They start to put a plastic sheet on top of it. Right? You see this? And they make some sort of like a front porch. Uh, they put the air conditioning in because it's really hot out there. And after this, they begin, they build a shelter more like from a wooden frame. They get that like a water tank, a settler dish. So you see the tent is becoming like a, more like a hut. These huts are built with wooden sticks, but most of them collapse during a storm or this spring. So what people do is the next step is a steel frame structure. And this is a durable solution because you can cover it with fabrics. But the main reason, most important reason is that people want a steel frame structure is become, because they can add a real door. And doors are very important because a door means privacy. Once you have a door, you can open it and close it. So that's, although you can cut through the walls, a door gives you some sense of privacy, privacy. The, the next step is that they are gonna build out, like they have a, a, a kitchen or a toilet they build like from plastic, they build like sort of like walls and they have like an antenna for uh, for the TV and they have things for water. So it becomes more like a, like a front porch, you could say. The next step is that they really build a house from corrugated steel plates on a frame with a flag and they can sort of like put in styrofoam so it gets less cold and less hot. The next step is a sustainable structure. That's like stones. That's like a real city. That's, that's when a city becomes like hard again. Because there are like big fires in the, in the camp. And, and so, so like all these other structures, they are very, yeah, how do you say, it? easy to burn down or easy to break down. So this is one of the first houses that was built in the camp. And it actually looks like a real house. It has barred windows, it has a porch. This is like the basic, basic house. But this was it built in the first street. So these houses are also quite, quite some worth some money already. Uh, this is some information about the project, about the things that they get. Like they all get a, like a plastic sheet with this logo of the UNHCR always on it. And this logo is also interesting when you, eh, we talk about data, we talk about how we subjectively read things. And this logo was so present there that I thought it's interesting to look at it a little bit longer and try to figure out what it means and not so much about what it means as a logo, but what does it mean? Where are we looking at and what, the, what does this mean? And I do this because a lot of people were living constantly within this, with this logo. And you realize that 
that they are the people that live with it. They are the persons that are in it. They are this person. They are the refugees. And they live in a world where they are depicted without arms or legs. So they're, they're, they're being depicted on a very helpless way, a very, uh, yeah, refugee victim. They're victimized in a way, stigmatized, you could say. And then these hands, uh, these hands that, that shelter them. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful picture, but it's, it's, it's not their hands. And then we have this red of laurels that is there. And you could also think somebody's triumphing here. Right? This is this is for winners. This, this these laurels. So, but who's the winner here? Is the winner here the the person that is that is the refugee that is the victim, or is the winner here the person that shelters the refugees? And I often I often find this this difficult to to explain. And then the color of blue is chosen because it's the complementary color for red. And red is the color of blood, or you could say war. So I was looking at this logo from a very subjective perspective, just looking at it and trying to figure out what it means. I also made some changes. I thought if we change the hands, if we turn them around, hey, first we have to covered like this, but if we turn them like this, that's already a big difference. Because when you do this, then we give the, the victim, the refugee, we give them space to grow instead of keeping keeping them victimized or keeping them small. So I'm not a graphic, uh, graphic designer, but I would like to prepare this because I think it's better. <laughs>